about shit with inspirational people from all walks of life. Today we are joined by the wonderful and inspiring Dan Flood. Dan, welcome to Chatting Shit with Austique. Thank you. Thank you for having me. That, the countdown that you mentioned was very, very dramatic. dramatic. <laughs> I'm actually shaking with anticipation. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Today's topic is stronger than ever with a stoma. And that is basically because your social media is so inspiring to see the kind of the before and after pictures and how much you've managed to push your body since having the surgery, I know has inspired a lot of people to see what their body is capable of. So very pleased to have you here. I'm really excited to delve into everything. Yeah, yeah, thank you for having me. And apologies for being, um, for delaying. I was a bit poorly. So thank no. you for understanding. I'm glad you're feeling better. Are you feeling better now? Yeah, yeah. It's, I think it's going around everywhere, a bit of a cold, but yeah, like, just got to get through it. I've tried to mega dose myself with vitamin C, but it didn't shift it. Oh, that's always the answer. <laughs> that and um, Manuka honey. It's my soul. Is it? Is that your secret recipe, secret potion? Secret potion. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, with the... Oh, sorry, Carol. No, I was just going to say, to begin with, would you mind just introducing yourself and perhaps telling us a bit about your journey with IBD and kind of how you came to have your stoma. Yeah, sure. So my name's Dan. Um, and if you follow me on Instagram, my name, which I need to change at some point is <laughs> at dodge one Now no. just to put this up publicly, because <laughs> okay. this plays in my mind quite a lot. It's an old Xbox Live gamer tag that I never changed. Oh. So I, I don't have some sort of, uh, I don't <laughs> think I'm any form of God. <laughs> so yeah, I'm glad that's actually out there. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, so um, my sort of journey with Crohn uh, with colitis um, started when I was young because my dad actually suffers with colitis. So he went through all of the disease and surgery throughout his life, and then it was actually about I think it was six or seven years before I was even diagnosed. My dad actually had um, <clears throat> the uh, the initial stoma surgery, and then and then the reversal. So I witnessed all of that as I was growing up. And then there must be some sort of um, poor genetic, genetics in my family because my cousin, John, who actually, he part, he plays for Team Colostomy UK. Oh, um, yeah. He's oh. also, yeah, John Flood. Yeah, I we're related. John. We said, yeah, I saw him at the game last weekend or the weekend before. Yeah, it's more world, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all little, I'm all loving it. So. <laughs> So obviously John's gone through his stuff as well. And then, and then it was my turn. So I was 21, 22, or whenever 2012 was, I don't know how old I am now. And um, I was diagnosed then with ulcerative colitis and I was a bit naughty because I was a young lad and I was bleeding a lot. Um, I'd moved out of my, my house by then. I was living with a, with a girl. And there was a lot of blood and I, I knew this wasn't right. And it was almost like out of fear. I didn't go and get diagnosed. Um, but yeah, so that from the space of 2012 to 2017, that's when I was like bombarded with all the drugs and treatments. I always spent between one or two months in hospital um, and I went through everything from prednisolone. I'm trying to remember them now. Uh, mesalazine. I had azathioprine, tacrolimus, uh, infliximab, uh, the injection ones, Humira. I went through all of them and they worked. They all worked for a short amount of time but they never kept me in remission longer than sort of six to eight months. So I'd always have, I knew like I'd be checking the watch once a year, I'm going to be going into hospital. And then it, <clears throat> my life went a bit wild in 2016, 2017. I had a lot of personal issues, a lot of, um, loads of stuff sort of went a bit haywire. And obviously that amounted to, to a lot of stress in my life. And stress was always my trigger with flair. It was never really food or, what I did or what I did and it was always the stress of going on and then that I had a particularly bad flare and that's when I had my emergency stoma surgery so yeah so that's the the illness part and then obviously the emergency stoma surgery um was quite at the time I didn't really have time to think about what was going on or process it yeah so um I think I spent about seven or eight weeks in hospital so I had the surgery which was obviously they put you through tests they, they see if you're going to you need the operation or not a check of the risk of perforation. Yeah. Um, and then I had the surgery. What what I struggled with afterwards was going into ileus where your digestive system shuts down. So I think I was I, I was unable to eat for nearly, I was, it was two weeks or something, 14 days or something. And I was one day, yeah, I was what every time I'd eat, um, getting a bit grim, I'd repeatedly vomit. So I had my stomach pumped every half an hour and then 
I was just sat there. It was, it was, it was a great time to be fair. I loved it. <laughs> and then, I'm so um, sorry. That's all right. It doesn't matter. Um, it's good. It's a good thing that happened overall. Um, then I was one day away from being fed through your, what's it called? Your heart. Is it T TPN? Yeah. My words and knowledge are out of, uh, I'm out of, uh, out of touch with all the terminology now since it's, um, I'm healthier, but yeah. And that day I was literally being prepped for it. And, um, this is again, it's going to sound a bit gross, but the, the, the nurse that was looking after me, he was pumping my stomach and he looked at me and I don't know what he did. He did something. <laughs> And as he, this is a bit grim, okay, but as he pumped, like my, it's out your nose, isn't it? I'll poke myself in the eye. Um, <laughs> <laughs> ooh, getting, I'm getting animated with my hands. Poke myself in the eye. As he pumped my stomach, I'll never forget this, like a chunk come through my stoma for the first time, but he really went for it. Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if there was correlation or not to that, but in my head, he, he got my digestive system Released right. Released whatever it was. Yeah, and then I managed to eat and then I slowly recovered. Um, do you want me to keep keep going about oh, the story? Please do. Please yeah, do. I told you I'm a waffler. No, um, I love it. Yeah, then the recovery was so that's that's obviously that pie that slowly healed up and recovered and adjusted to the lifestyle. But what I didn't probably recover from was maybe some of the traumatic stuff that had happened in my life beforehand. Um, some of the personal issues I was dealing with before hospital, and then the added strain of surgery. Um, it all amounted up into this this part where my mental health was extremely poor. I was, I, and it's not directly related because of the surgery, because I don't want people to think, oh, I had surgery and that's made my mental health bad. It was an accumulation of a lot of negative aspects yeah. of my life at the time, but that was obviously the tipping point. And I did, I did, um, I was quite unwell. I was under the care of the community mental health team for a while. I was treated for um, like psychosis, anxiety, and depression. So, um, that was that. And then uh, to be fair, there was obviously there's a lot of resources that's helped this medication, but the thing that got me through it, um, one was adjusting to my routine, getting back into work. That was a huge thing for me. And cause you, you can become so isolated. I think sometimes when you're ill, you forget that people, how understanding people are when you've almost cut yourself off. Sometimes people generally human nature is to care and want to help other people. They don't want to sit there and stigmatize and criticize unless you're some sort of freak. So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, I fully support that. Yeah, I'm, what am I saying? So yeah, when I got back into work and then I always trained on and off in between flares. So it was more like, it was, it was, there was parts where I was quite serious about my training, but it was more like something to do with the lads. Like, yeah. do you know what I mean? So yeah, um, just, I was committed to training regularly, but I didn't really, I'd still go out the weekend and drink and party if if I was healthy. Yeah. Uh, live relatively normal life when I was was have those small parts in remission between hospital. Um, I was probably a little bit wild actually. I think a few of my friends would agree. Um, I think that's pretty normal at that age. Yeah, I was quite wild. And then, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but then after surgery, I sort of I started. I was like, I something. I just woke up one day and I was like, look, I'm not happy with the way I look, and I can't change the fact I've got this stone on me. But what I can change is the things within my control which is I can change my habits, my sleep, my eating, I can go to the gym. And you don't have to do a huge amount of work in regards to your fitness to make quite a big impact. You just need to be consistent with what you do. So um, I started just going three, four days a week. I remember I used to go with this guy called Jack who I used to work with. Um, and I was like, I was quite anxious. And it's the first time I've been back into a gym and it was a new gym in a new area I was living in. And I walked in and, um, I, was, I just went through the sort of just got used to the environment, got used to the machines, acclimatized to what the people are like, what the layout's like. I think that's a good tip for anyone going to a new gym, regardless of the condition, is the first time you go there, just look round and get used to scope the environment. Scope it out a bit. Yeah, scope yeah. it out, use a few machines and don't don't stress yourself out too much. And then you realize it's not that scary. Um, but then Jack, bless him, he was he used to stand me up. Oh, lovely. Like, <laughs> yeah. He probably won't watch this, so it's fine. <laughs> but you know, I, used to, I used to be like, oh, you, you come into the gym and I'll be outside. It'd be winter. I'll be shivering and I'd be still a bit nervous to go in. And I was like, what am I doing? Just go in on your own. Like I used to do this all the time. What's the what's the worry about? Just because you've got a, a stoma or a bag. No one's going to know. I've got a big T-shirt on. And then it just went from there. I start. I, I started training consistently. I started eat, making myself eat more because I, I probably wasn't the best at that before. Um, and 
Um, yeah, so I, I sort of got my confidence a little bit more. So obviously, I put a little bit of weight on back on, which I never was. Be, I never was able to do that before surgery. I'd always struggle, yeah. especially like my. I know it sounds. Oh, blokes want big biceps, don't they? Yeah. And I could never. My chest would sometimes grow, but then I'd be like this because <laughs> my arms. <laughs> Your weight must have, I'm assuming your weight really plummeted after surgery when you had that two weeks where you, you couldn't eat at all. Yeah, to so the two weeks beforehand. So, yeah, I, I told you I'd go tangent, rain me back in, Liv. No, 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 I'm <laughs> loving this. <laughs> so, yeah, with um, with my weight, it, um, the, the two weeks beforehand, I was very, very ill in hospital before the surgery. Yeah. Um, I was, I think I was quite, I think I was like unconscious for most of it as well because I had an infection. I had some other stuff happening as well as the, the, the colitis flare, which was quite bad. And I wasn't really eating. I kept getting put on nil by mouth for uh, colonoscopies and other tests. Yeah. So I, I had hardly any meals in the run up before my surgery anyway. So I'd lost a lot of weight. I think I went down to, so I, I weigh now, I'm, I'm, I'm six foot tall. I'm 106 kilos. Um, but I think I went down to something like 73, 74, which is quite light. What's that in stone? Oh, I don't know how to get to calculator. Sorry, I have no <laughs> idea how to exist in kilos. I'm sorry. I don't know. But it's like it's like a th it's like losing a, th a third of what I am now, a whole third person. That's um, a lot. And then after the surgery, I had a lot of I had a huge amount of water retention because of the I was still being put in with steroids um, and um, the inflammation and that sort of stuff around your body. So I, I did. I had like a little like a pot belly sort of pig for a bit. Mm. Everybody feels gets exactly the same though, don't they? After the surgery. Yeah. I'll tell you something funny that I did do. Okay, so I think I know a lot about. I'm I'm a bit overconfident sometimes with my knowledge of things. Okay. So I remember I overheard the doctors when I was lying in bed saying, "Oh, his, his potassium's too low. His potassium's too low." And I was desperate to get out of hospital. So I was like, "Right, what's what loads of potassium in? Is coconut water, isn't it?" Oh, I was going to say bananas. <laughs> no, with, my, with, my, with my stuff on me. And, and I went to the shop and I bought three of those really strong coconut waters of loads of potassium. <laughs> <laughs> and I drank them all. And the next time they did my um, their bloods or something or, or whatever they were testing, they were like, his potassium's really, really high. We need to get him an ECG straight away. <laughs> <laughs> that and I was like, you, trying to skew yeah. your results. Yeah, I was, I was trying to get out of hospital. And I was like, right, coconut me and then get me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously... You had a big journey physically, also had a big journey mentally. Yeah. How long after your stone surgery did you start going back to the gym with Jack? Yeah, so I've been Jack off quite quickly, just so yeah. you know. Um, <laughs> um, let me do my timeline in my head. Probably about a year and a half, I'd say. But you don't need to wait that long. So there's, there's a load of... Um, inf there's a load of misinformation, I'd say, out there where people say you've got to wait eight weeks before you lift this. You've got to wait um, six to eight months to, before you do this. It's completely subjective. So it depends on how you heal, your body type, the amount of muscle you had before, whether you trained before. You can't have a one size fits all when you return to training after stoma surgery. Yeah. Um, I think people who've had conditions really know what their body feels like. I think you know if you're going to be fit enough to do that. But if you're finding yourself having to force yourself and things internally don't feel correct, you need to wait. Definitely. I would suggest getting the okay from any surgeon or stoma nurse before going. But so you can do. Sorry. Yeah. Go on. Sorry. When you started training, what did you start with? Was it just some very basic stuff? Were you trying to build up your core strength? What? How did you kind of approach it? So, um, in, again, from... Just for experience, I've always had a certain sort of like routines in my head. So I'd always target on one or two muscle groups per session. Um, it started off with a bit of what they call a bro split, if you go to the gym, which is where you go arms one day, legs one day, chest one day, that sort of thing. Um, but it was a lot of a lot of higher rep, lighter weight stuff. So I do a lot of 15 to 20 reps, but slow and controlled. Mm -hmm. um, Movements, I, I believe personally, movements, comp we call a compound movement, which is a multi-joint movement. So, for example, if you want to do a shoulder press, you're going like that and your shoulders are moving and so, yeah, so is your elbow. That's a multi-joint movement, yeah? Mm -hmm. Things that require that need indirect core stability. So you're not essentially crunching down on your core, which can be quite distressing if your muscles have been torn. 
Yeah. Um, however, you need it for stability. So I did a lot of moves like that, like squats, deadlifts, um, rows, presses, that sort of thing. Um, and that just slowly built my core up over time. That's a really good idea. Because you're not doing, you're not directly targeting the muscle, but it's being used. And it's not just your, the, the people think your core is just your abs. It's not, you've got the obliques, you've got the bits where it, I can't remember the names, the bits that lead down into your groin. Yeah. Um, you, it's the whole, the whole core that needs to be stable, especially if you've got a stoma, because it's a, it's a hole in it, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I wonder if you wouldn't mind me picking up on this and tell me if you don't want to talk about it. Okay. You mentioned that when you were, get quite poorly during those sort of four years before your surgery, you were in a relationship and living with that person. Uh, at the beginning. And then oh, when and you, I was diagnosed, yeah. When you came to have your surgery, were you in a relationship? No, there was, there was quite a few in between that. <laughs> <laughs> so when no. you had yeah. your surgery, did you have mm. to date someone for the first time with a stoma? Yeah, yeah. So I have, yeah, I've dated people since my surgery, obviously. I'm with a girl now who's absolutely fantastic. So I've seen Naomi. Naomi, yeah. Beautiful. You've done, well. done well. <laughs> yeah, she, 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 she looks good, doesn't she? She's beautiful. <laughs> um, would you mind talking about, we, we've had a lot of female guests come yeah. and talk about what it's like dating and putting yourself out there and intimacy with a stoma for the first time with new partners. Would you yeah. mind talking a bit about what that's like from a male perspective. Yeah, so it leads back into a little bit of what I said about people being understanding and supportive. Um, whenever, what I would suggest is, again, this might sound like a bit of common advice, but you have to bring it to someone's attention and like at the start. So if you if you were interacting with someone, uh, texting or whatever, at that stage before you sort of meeting up, I would definitely encourage someone to mention it then. And if someone, is put off by that they're not someone worth your time because you, how are you going to have a relationship with someone who can't be understanding at that point there's there's no longevity there so I um i know it's scary and it's daunting but you just need to be up front and i think what you'll find if you are as a bloke dating you might get one or two people that get knocked back and it might hurt your confidence a little bit <laughs> but if you're chatting to people you and you're up front you'll become less scary if you said it a few times for a few different people I would start by telling like friends and people, or just I tell people in the gym when I walk into just the gym. Just tell everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Watch me squat. <laughs> That's a really good, really, really good point there. You become less sensitive to something once you've had that conversation so many times. Anything that's scary in life or worrying, you ha you can desensitize yourself to it just through exposure. So you have to put yourself in, in uncomfortable, challenging situations in order to grow as a person. Mm. And unfortunately for people with our condition, we've got this extra challenge we have to do. But I think it makes you, one, I think it helps build your character. And two, it improves your tolerance for dealing with life's normal crap. <laughs> so. Absolutely agree with that. Talking of dealing with life's normal crap, do you think that yeah. <laughs> focusing on fitness and strength and I guess also having to have some sort of guardrails around your life like you can't just just go wild if you've got a real strict gym routine for example because you know that you want to be up the next day you want to be in there etc do you think that yeah. that's had an enormous or in any effect on your mental well-being a hundred hundred percent yeah there's been there's been a few life's been a bit stuff i probably i don't want to go into too much in the detail of what's happened but there's been some pretty messed up stuff that's gone on in life i think everyone's had some messed up stuff go on yeah and um, whether it's regards to stoma or relationships or whatever whatever um but the one thing i always say to myself is that i can lose a job i could lose a relationship i could lose my friends but no one can take away the fact that i can go to the gym so it's like a constant in my life so yeah. i always if i'm ever feeling depressed or down or things are feeling like they could be going out of control i always know i can go there I see. I think I see you describe it as like a hidden power to overcome yeah. anything that gets thrown at you. I really love that. It is, yeah. I think people are a lot more resilient than they think as well, and it's it's hard sometimes to realise that if um, you're going through a stage in life where things seem overwhelming um, and you can't see the the greater perspective, but 
there's always a reason for something that happens and you'll always learn something from it and it will make you stronger in life. So, yeah. I um, I noticed that you started your account, you posted quite a lot of pictures of your journey and yourself in the gym, but you did not show your stoma in any of the pictures for quite a while. Good, and then one question. day it looked like it just something switched for you. And obviously so many people are so glad it did, but I just wondered what that journey to kind of showing it was like. Yeah, so like the Instagram thing kind of happened. I mean, I've got not, I've got a huge account, but it's slowly growing um, as, as with, with certain things I do. But the Instagram thing started, I was like, I sort of cut myself off social media for a couple of years. I went completely silent. Like, I don't have Facebook. I don't have Twitter or Snapchat or anything like that. I've only got Instagram and now TikTok. <clears throat> um, but I was I went completely silent. And I cut a lot of friends off. Everything. I just went. I was like, right focus on your job then focus on the gym and then maybe just work on social social life that was how my brain was working at the time and part of that was like i said removing social media but i started going back to the gym and i was like oh i was like i see a lot of people filming their stuff i'm like it just popped into my head because my strength started going on quite 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 well and i started putting on a, a bit of muscle and i was like i'm actually feeling feeling not too bad about myself now i was like and it just someone, I don't know if it was Misha or someone said it to me, you should post it. I can't remember, but then I just started posting lifts and I'd post stuff wearing the belts. And then yeah. it got to a point where I think I delayed showing my stoma and then it became a thing in my head. So yeah. I've got a friend, um, Keith, who's the counselor of Room 5 Photography. He he was like, look, why don't you do a photo shoot, like a proper, some proper photo, a photo if you're going to do it. So I was like, I did that and it got really well received. I think got, I think quite a lot of popularity that post when I first did it and it was quite a dramatic looking picture. So I think that added yeah. to sort of the, <laughs> the like, <"Rah." laughs> but I hate it because I'm bigger now. So I'm like, I look it back at it and I'm like, oh, actually I'm bigger than you. Now. could do your next photo shoot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's, that's why I did it. I was like, right, if I'm going to do it, let's do a proper picture. Let's, let's expose a bit of myself in, in it, like with the comments. Yeah. Um, I used to, I mean, I still do when I have the time, I still do like a little offload. Instagram is very much like me talking to no one, but everyone sometimes. So I'll put on there. Sometimes it's just me as a picture of me. Sometimes it's a lift. Cause I'm, I'm personally, I'm proud that I can do that. Yeah. And then sometimes I'll be like, this is in my head. Let me just dump it into a caption. Do you know what I mean? See what comes back. Yeah. In terms of social media in general, obviously there's some amazing sides of social media. It's incredible. It can help people feel connected. It's great. Yeah. But there's also some negatives to sharing on social media. And I sure. wondered if you have encountered any of those and if so, how you have dealt with them. Um, I've se- Do you know what? I'll be completely honest. I've seen a lot of other people experience negative stuff and I have had the odd few message, but I haven't had that much negativity. That's great. Um, it is good. I've had a few comments on TikTok saying, oh, what was it? It was so funny. Oh, what did they call it? I called it, I, think, I can't remember what they said, which is no, which is no good because it's not going to be funny, but they said something to me <laughs> and they called it this like terminology and it was, it was meant to be abusive, but it was quite, I thought it quite funny. <laughs> I guess I I've had a few DMs. Um, I think I had one about a year or so ago, like, um, like calling me disgusting and things like that. But I don't know where I haven't actually shown the stoma site. I think I'm less exposed to that sort of abuse because that's the sort of stuff when I've seen people do bag changes or um, pictures of the stoma site. That's when I've seen people draw attention, which is mm. completely unnecessary. But I guess if someone's sat there. And they're on their computer and they're looking at you being brave and sharing and exposing yourself and trying to do something good. And all they can do is literally dedicate mental energy and the energy to their fingers to type a horrible message. They've got some serious problems. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. They have nothing better to do. Do you know what I mean? So, and most of the time, a lot of these people wouldn't say these things to your face. So yeah anonymity of social media means people say a lot of things that they would never really mean or say it's scary biscuits in them yeah <laughs> in terms of before um we actually pushed record we were talking about um our founder stephanie and her brothers and their journey and the kind of story about the fact that 
a lot of people with IBD, especially people who are young, will put off having surgery for a really long time because of the kind of, kind of concerns about what life will be like or kind of stigma associated with it. Yeah. And it looked like that really resonated with you. And I wondered what you would say to somebody who's in that position, potentially suffering every day with not a great quality of life at the moment and what, what you might say from your experience. Yeah, so I, I was in that place where I was terrified of the thought of it. But looking back, um, one, I think, obviously, I have, the, the surgery can either go really well or sometimes there be complications, but you will always get better. But I've never been as fit as I am now. I've never had the perspective on life that I've had now. And I've never um, been as, as positive in my general attitude since I've had that. The condition itself of just the general fatigue when you have Crohn's or colitis, it slowly breaks you down every day. Whether you, you can try and fight against it, 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 it takes a toll. It will strain um, lots of aspects of your life. Sometimes it can be told of medication, but if you have the option of surgery, um, it can prevent all the, the, the crap side effects from medication that you'll get uh, or potentially get. I don't want to scare people. Um, it literally has made my life a lot better. And I, I mean, I everyone's different. I'm not going to get it reversed. So I'm going to keep my bag. Why would I change it? It's working for me. Um, I'm the healthiest I've ever been. I'm the strongest I've ever been. So I'm just going to stay as I am. So if anyone's worried about it, reach out to someone who's had one. And I guarantee you they'll tell you it's the best thing that's happened to them. I love that. In terms of your reversal, did your team, your team of kind of doctors, etc., come to you and say, this is an option? Is this something that you want to explore? Or did you just, you knew you didn't want to go there, so it wasn't even brought up? Yeah, I think um, I was just like, right, I'm leave me alone for a bit. I'm done with hospitals. I'll talk about reversal in a year or something. And then I've just come to the conclusion myself, like this is working for me. Um, with any surgery, there's there, there's an element of risk isn't there? So I just, I don't see any need when it's risk versus reward in my head of, uh, of doing that again. It works for me. It's fine. Um, my girlfriend's fine with it. Uh, I can go to the gym. I can go to work. Um, I can still do anything I want to do. So I don't need to change anything. If it's not broke, don't fix it. I love that. I think that's a great <laughs> note to end on. Thank okay. you so much dan i've absolutely loved talking to you and if you do find that tiktok that was comment that was meant to be rude but it actually turns out to be funny let me know <laughs> i will do <laughs> right yeah thank you for having me so much no worries see you soon, see you soon. cheers have you seen the new austique skins yet austique skins are revolutionary ostomy pouch covers that were created to make the wearer feel confident sexy and powerful in all of life's moments from moments of intimacy to lounging by the pool, conquering a workout or simply heading out to lunch, skins have you covered. Even better, they're compatible with all major colostomy and ileostomy bags. Austique skins are available in a range of colours and skin tones and they're made from a revolutionary material that's completely waterproof, high quality, soft and comfortable. Skins are easy to use even with reduced dexterity and they work with both closed and drainable bags. Plus, skins are also environmentally friendly and vegan. There are four bundles available to buy now and you can also purchase individual skins. Head to austique.co.uk to find out more.